So I've spoken about a lot of these different things, right? But this is the reason why I end up leaving the Conservative Party, right? First of all, they're not fiscally conservative. So this is something I have to really explain to people, right? In terms of fiscal conservatism, it's supposed to be in favour of responsibility, right? It's supposed to be in favour of, right, so we've taxed this much and we're spending this much and we're not going to spend more than what we raise through tax revenue, right? However, the Conservative Party has not done that, right? We are in the middle of a debt crisis and this is the first time in our history we've been in a debt crisis, not because of war. You know, the last time we were in this level of debt was back in like 1960, right? And that was because we were coming back from like World War II in 1945. And so like the debt levels were incredibly, incredibly high because we were obviously paying that back and paying it down every single year. Duh, 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 duh. And, you know, so you can see on the, on the graph here, it's, it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. So in 2002, our debt to GDP ratio, right, was just 27%. So just 27% of GDP was public debt, right? By the time it got to 2010, it risen to 64%, right? So you could go, oh, okay, cool, there was the recession, et cetera, et cetera, in like 2007, 2008. So it rose then, okay, fine. So that's 64%, right? In 2019, so bear in mind, this is before Corona, right? And this is years of so-called austerity, right? This is nine years of so-called austerity when the Conservative government have been in power and they've been like, right, we're, we're clamping down on this, right? The debt figures rose to 82%, right? It rose to 82%. And then now we have Corona, right? It's now risen to 104%, right? Uh, so this is the largest level of uh, debt that we've had since 1960. And we don't really have anything to show for it, right? So even before COVID, we had nothing to show for this, right? And now we're just getting into even more debt. What for, right? And it's supposed to be the party of fiscal responsibility. No government in this country has balanced the budget since 2001. Okay, there was one year in like, 2019 where we just about, just about like, kind of got over the line, right? But you've had years and years of excessive government spending at a time of relative peace. Yes, you had the war on terror and stuff, but it wasn't exactly World War Two, you know, like uh, our defense spending didn't suddenly like rapidly uh, expand, yeah, like the levels we saw in World War One and World War Two. In, in real terms, it was a, a small war, right? And most of the spending was done because of social programs, right? So it wasn't really to do with our war there at all. So this was completely avoidable. And the Conservative Party have now been in power for 11 years. And what have they done about it? Nothing. On top of that, government spending is the highest it's been since 1947 and taxation is the highest it's been since the mid 80s, right? So 1993, the year of my birth, the amount of tax that we had as a percentage of GDP was about 31.5%, right? Now it's at 37.5% and it went from 35 .5 to 37.5% during this time, right? So from 2010 to, uh, to the present day, right, it's gone up under the Conservative Party, right? And this is, you know, you can say COVID, et cetera, et cetera, but it's gone up anyway. And government spending since the year 2000, yeah, has gone up from 31% to now 52%, right? So over half of all the economy, right? So half of all the money you've been spent in that year, right? is going to the government, right? And also as well, we have a highly centralized uh, government within this country in which 80% of it is spent from central government. So local government makes up 20% of it. The central government, you know, Westminster makes up 80% of that. So almost 40% of the entire economy is being spent from Westminster. And then you wonder why London ends up being, you know, you know taking up a huge, huge percentage of like the, the, uh, the UK's uh, population and of its GDP and stuff, yeah? It's because all the power and all the money is being drained from the rest of the country into London to go into civil servants, going to politicians, etc, etc. This is the situation we have at the moment. And it's been happening more and more so under a Conservative government. And what about the so-called austerity? Well, okay, right. So in 2005, we're looking at a health spending now. It went from 6% of GDP. Then it went up to 7.5% in 2010, right? So the Labour Party within those five years, right, raised it from 6% to 7.5, right? The Conservative Party by 2019 had reduced it from 7.5 to 7. So not even going back to the levels it was before 2005, right? It's not even going back to the times you know, during like, uh, the Labour government stuff, right? It reduced it from 7.5 to 7. Now under COVID, it's now shot up to 10.44%, right? So you'd be like, okay, right, it's because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. But still, even before then, it still was ridiculously high levels of, uh, of healthcare spending, right? So this is a time of so-called austerity. And what about national insurance, right? So national insurance has 
pretty much the reason why I ended up doing this video here, because it really, really annoyed me when the Conservatives uh, recently raised this, right? So as a percentage of GDP, in 2010, it was 6.2%. In 2021, it's 6.9%, right? So it's gone up under the Conservative Party, but this before they raised it recently, right? And on top of that, yeah, when you look at uh, national insurance, it disproportionately affects working people and middle class people, right? Far more so than it does the rich. So if you're someone who earns £50,000 a year, right, this before the recent changes, right, you paid roughly about £5,000 a year in national insurance. If you're someone earning a quarter of a million, so five times as much, you only paid £9,000 a year, right? You know, you could be earning almost five times more and not even be paying twice as much, right? This shows how broken national insurance is because people often think, oh, it's just putting money in to, you know, to, to help like, like grandma out in like the, the nursing home and it's like doing this and it's doing that. No, it's just another tax which has been spent, right? And it's coming from your pockets and it's going to just be wasted by the government, right? Obviously, the government does some good things, but it's incredibly, incredibly inefficient, right? And we talk about that at endless lengths of how inefficient it is this is not the video for that right but the point is this right even before this it was a you know disproportionate tax which affected working class and middle class people and barely touched the rich at all right and now it's been raised even more so right so i've not even looked at the figures for it now but you guys can look at it yourself yeah and and tell me whether this is a system which makes any level of sense on top of that vat has also gone up as well so VAT under the Conservative government, yeah, from 2010 was at, you know, it was at 6.9 percent. By 2020, it had risen to 8.2 percent, right? So it's not to do with the, the crisis, et cetera, et cetera. It's to do with them putting the tax burden more and more on working class and poor people, right? And this is the thing: the Conservative Party doesn't care about poor people, right? Now. The Labour Party also doesn't care about them as well. They should change their name. Like that, you know, maybe they should just merge with like the Lib Dems and form like the Democrat Party, whatever. But considering the fact that most working class people now vote for the, the, the Conservative Party and most uh, upper and middle class people now tend to vote for the Labour Party, maybe they should change the name on that. But I'm talking now to you know working class uh, Tory voters and stuff here. Yeah? Look at this. It doesn't make any sense yet. Yeah? Why are you still voting for this party, right? If you're a fiscal conservative, you should not be voting for the Conservative Party because what have they done in the last 11 years they've been in government, which is fiscally conservative? Tell me, please tell me, what, what have they done which is fiscally conservative, yeah? What, what have they done to lower taxes? What have they done, you know, even if, even, if you're, even if you're rich and stuff, right? They raised it from 40% to 45%, right? So, wh 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 you know, wh where's, where's the fiscal conservatism at all? It doesn't exist, right? And this is another thing as well, right? So, me being a conservative, why would you vote for a Conservative Party if you want to reform things, right? So the Brexit Party changed itself to Reform UK and I want to reform things, right? So there's lots of things I like with this system. However, there's lots of things I don't like about the system, right? And as George Dawson said, you know, reform delayed is revolution begun. And that's the mantra that I've kind of lived by in recent years here, right? So there's so many things, there's so many constitutional reforms which need to be done. There's so many legislative reforms that need to be done. For instance, why do we still have an uh, unelected House of Lords, right? Why do we still have a first-past-the-post system, right? Why do we have all these different things? Like, it, the, the system is broken. There's, there's, I could go on for endless, endless amount of time about this, year. And why do we still not have a written constitution, right? It, well, we do, but it's, it's all over the place, right? Why do we not have a codified constitution? Actually, this is something which, in my own spare time, after, because I've recently I've been like reading the Federalist Papers and I've been reading the Anti-Federalist Papers and looking into the framers of like, the, the US Constitution and all the kind of debates surrounding that and stuff, right? And you go, okay, right, this, you know, what came out of this, whether you agree with some parts or disagree, there was some level of debate that went into this. Whereas we just have a system which kind of goes, eh, we'll just add this on and just add that on. And oh yeah, there's that, that thing there that contradicts that. And no one knows, in the time of crisis, like when we had Brexit, nobody knew where the buck like uh, uh, landed yet. No one knew like, kind of what should be done right who has more uh, like preeminence like like, like there's no who has checks and balances there was there was nothing right it was complete chaos it was complete shambles and that's why i've actually started drafting an english constitution right uh so that obviously won't be out for many many years although i do have a draft of it if people would be interested
interested in having that conversation, right? You know, so I want to conserve certain parts of the country, right? So, you know, the fact that obviously, you know, as, as I've said in previous videos, yeah, you know, we are the, the, you know, land of hope and glory, the mother of the free, right? You know, our Anglo-Saxon heritage, you know, this is where we get the idea of limited government from, this is where we get the idea of individual liberty from. So I'm all in favour of preserving that and conserving that, right? But I want to reform things. I don't just want to keep things the way they are. And the way things are, are not like, right. <laughs> we have basically a socialized like system, right? Where the government is a huge, huge part. Even before this crisis, government played far too big of a role. And so I don't really want to conserve that. I want to change that, right? I don't want to get rid of the government completely. You know, there's obviously like a need for government, but I want it to be drastically reduced in the size and scope of what it is currently. So I don't want to conserve that, I want to reform that. And so here's my message to Conservative Party voters, right? Okay, if you are of like, like you know, the top 5% of the, of the country, right? If you're part of like the kind of like Bullingdon boy, kind of like, you know, if you're, you know, if you went to boarding school, if you're, you know, very, very rich, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you, your father owns a business and blah, blah, blah. I get it. I'm not going to tell you, you know, so for me, I vote for politics, not because of what's in my self-interest, because... For me, regardless of who gets into government, doesn't really affect my day-to-day -day life. It's not really, you know, there might be some slight inconveniences and some slight benefits, but my life is not really affected by who ends up, you know, and most people's lives are not really that affected. There's only a handful of people who are significantly affected by any kind of government policies, yeah, especially within a liberal democracy when policy is not too extreme. So I've always been interested in politics for the nation's interest. And I don't really do it because it's like, oh, well, this will help me and stuff, right? But some people vote along those kind of lines, right? So if you are someone from like the, you know, the, the upper echelons of society and stuff, right? And you kind of want to preserve the system as it currently is, calm, good luck to you, vote for the Conservative Party. But if you're middle class or if you're working class or if you're, you know, why are you voting for the Conservative Party? Especially if you're Brexiteer, you voted to leave the EU, leave the Conservative Party, right? The Reform Party, you know, formerly the Brexit Party, that is the party which better represents you, right? And actually, even a majority of Conservative Party members would be happy with Nigel Farage being the leader of the Conservative Party, right? So the Reform Party is kind of where you guys are at anyway, right? So why not just vote for what, what, what is in your heart? And I get it, obviously, a lot of people tactically vote and stuff, yeah? And people, I've even spoken to some people, yeah, who go, you know what, I agree with what you're saying, 100% I agree with what you're saying, but I really hate Labour and I really don't want to see Labour back in. Okay, that doesn't make any sense, right? So, like, so you're picking the lesser of two evils, why not just go with what you actually want and then if everyone did that then the reform party would be the replacement of the conservative party yeah and then that would be the dominant kind of party on the so-called right right so also i just want to say this point what is the point in voting for the, the conservative party right as i've already laid out it's pretty much blue labor right there's no real point there's no like you know whether you're voting for the Labour party or whether you're voting for uh, for for like the the conservative party it doesn't make any difference right these people are just blairites in blue right they don't actually really care about you and they are doing things in their own interest and stuff right and they're not representing your interest not representing conservative values so why would you continue to vote for a party which doesn't actually believe in conservatism it doesn't make any sense does it no exactly so stop doing it right the definition of insanity Sanity is keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. Stop voting for a party which claims to be conservative but doesn't actually do anything, right? <laughs> so, you know, why would you continue to do that? Vote for your heart, vote for your mind, vote for your soul, vote for a party which represents you, right? And, you know, even if you can't bring yourself to a vote for a reform party, vote for literally anyone, even vote for Labour, right? If you, if you, if it's, you know, and this is what I would say, right? I would rather have 10 years of Labour government then have one more year of this fake conservative government. That's how serious I'm about this year. Because what is the difference, right? You're having huge levels of debt, you're having huge levels of spending, you're having huge levels of taxation. You may as well just vote for the Labour Party. What is the point in voting for a conservative party which does all those things anyway? You see what I'm saying? So that's basically my stance on that. And also just the final thing, the final cherry on the top, right? The top 10 Tory donors, right? These are 10 individuals. They make up about a quarter of all of the Conservative Party donations, right? You know, and then if you scaled it down to like how many people make up 50% and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the Conservative Party doesn't 
care about you people, right? It doesn't listen to your interests, right? Who are they going to listen to? You, you know, Joe Bloggs down the street, or are they going to listen to like these 10 top donors? Yeah, they're going to listen to the top 100 donors, right? You know, these are millionaires and billionaires and stuff, right? They don't represent your interests, right? And if you want to continue to vote for them, that's fine. But just understand that, you know, when you vote for them, and then they don't do what you told them to vote for, yeah, don't be surprised, because this is the, the logical conclusion of it. We have a broken politics in this country, we have a broken system. And if you continue to contribute to this, yeah, don't be surprised when you're having a broken system, right? If you stop contributing to it, the system will get better. And so, all that being said, uh, don't forget to hit the like button uh, if you like this video and also share it with your friends as well. Sharing is caring and also as well we have merchandise so definitely check out uh, our merchandise as well. Hit us up on Instagram if you're interested in any 